Well, we're going to take it slow a little bit this <laughs> on the second session. We're going to take it a little bit slow. Join. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Um, you know, when I grew up, I didn't have a father. Just when I started right there, I lost my father when I was one year, six months, and for 25 years, I never saw a picture of a father modeling fatherhood in my life. Imagine as a young person, 25 years old, you've never seen, you know, somebody modeling, you know, a fatherhood character in your life. And I grew up as an angry young man. And some of you know my story that at the age of 10, I had to run away from home. And I was in the streets, you know, for five years. At the age of 15, I was taught how to read and never had a picture of a father in my, in my life. And that brought a lot of bitterness. I could not even become a good husband because I've never seen somebody showing me how to be a good husband until the age of 26, you know, when my spiritual father, uh, who was my pastor then, decided that he's going to model me because I was also concerned. And not only that, and then God made my ways to meet with a man, you know, from PE by the name of, you know, Dremont Robinson. And those people, Dremont and my late father, they taught me how to become a good son. You know, and I just thought, because even when you read um, the, the, the news or what is out there. They are saying fathers play an important role in a child's development, you know, from birth through adulthood, you know, and studies have been made that, you know, children with involved fathers have advantage socially and academically. It is a fact. I'm saying that because I want you to understand that it's what you need to do as a father to, to your child for them to to become good men and great leaders. And I'm so grateful for these two men in my life. And based on that, um, I want to talk to you about the lessons, you know, that I have learned from my father. I've, I've entitled my message that lessons my father taught me. So when I'm talking about that, I'm referring to these two men who taught me how to become a good father. And I pray that with these few points, and my lessons, you're going to take that and they're going to become a blessing to you. The first scripture that I was given, you know, by my pastor and then trying to develop me to be a good father, it was in the book of Proverbs, 20, uh, Proverbs 3. We should realize that this was a conversation between a father and the son. And it will take some few points, you know, what my father's taught me. Is that, is that clear? Is that the background makes sense to you? I did not have a father, but I thank God for this fathers, the role that they've played to me. And then when you read here, it's a conversation between a father and the son. So Proverbs 3, verse 1 to verse 12, he says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life. I love that. For they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. This is the father talking to his son. He says, you want to prosper. You want to be successful. You know, he says, keep my command. He says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. What a good father teaching his son that. And in verse 4 says, then you will win favor and good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. What a teaching from a father, you know, to, to the son. He says, in all your ways, my son, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. He goes on this father, he says, fear the Lord and shun evil. Isn't that a good teaching from a father? Saying, fear the Lord and shun evil. And he says, this will bring health to your body and nourishment, you know, to your bones. He goes on, the father says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruit of your all crops. What a father teaching his sons. Oh, his son, honor the Lord. How I wish and pray that this is what we need to do to our sons, to honor the Lord with their money. You know, he says, then your bonds will be filled to overflowing. 
and your vats will brim over the new wine. And he says, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. What a beautiful scripture. What a beautiful conversation between a father and a son. How I wish I could ask you, what conversation do you have with your son? When you sit over the table, what are you talking about? How are you preparing your son as fathers in this ministry? Do you have time where you sit with these young boys and say, son, this is what I've experienced. These are the things I've gone through in life. And this is how you succeed. You know, sometimes we take this thing for, for granted. We think our boys will just grab these things and move on. But I've realized that as a man in the house of the Lord, you've got a responsibility, you know, to impart in the lives of the next generation if we really want to have a great church, if we really want to have a church that is going to impact, you know, the next generation. We must be intentional about it. This is the father who was intentional, you know, about raising his son, you know, to become a good leader. You know, and he had to have that conversation. So I want to I wanna challenge you as men, you know, to continue doing that and then so that we can train this generation. And I'm so grateful to the Lord that, you know, there were lessons that were given to me. I want to give you 10 lessons my father's taught me over the years. If you look at me today as a product, it is because there's these 10 things that I've picked up from my father. The first one, my spiritual father was my pastor. He said to me, Chris... You need to understand that people matter to God. That was the first lesson to, he, he, he taught me. He said, people matter to God. He says, no matter who they are, where they are, and how they are. He said, if you want to become a great leader, if you want to become a man of influence, he says, this is what I want you to know. People matter to God. That is why he sent his only son to come and die for them. He said it doesn't matter the color of their skin. You know, if you want God to favor you, you need to know that people matter, you know, to God. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter how they are. It doesn't matter where they are. That is why even this morning I am here, because people matter to God. That didn't matter the color of their skin. Now listen to me, if you want to become a good son, if you want to become a good dad, yeah, take it from me. People matter to God. It doesn't matter who they are, where they are. If you can love them as God loves them, and then you will gain favor with men and gain favor with God. You know, based on that point, we even created now a foundation that we call People Matter because of that teaching. And this foundation is it, it, out there to take care for the people because of what my father taught me to say people matter to God. And if they matter to God, they should also matter to you. That was a lesson, number one, that I've learned from my father. And lesson number two that I've learned from my father is that Money, it is not everything. Money, it is not everything. And I love the way he put it to me over there. He says, you don't need money to enjoy life. You need life to enjoy money. How's that? <laughs> money, it is not everything. And our boys and our daughters, they need to know that it is not about money. You need life. If you can have life, and you would enjoy life. And the scripture I was given then, it was First Timothy chapter 6. Listen what it says. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, not money, but the love of money. Money is not evil. It is just the love of it. It says, some people eager for money and have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And but you, men of God, flee from all this and pursue what? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. And it goes on in verse 12. It says, fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of eternal life. So he was saying to me, seek it first the kingdom of God. Seek it first his kingdom. If you seek it first his kingdom and not pursue money, money will pursue you. 
I did not go to ministry for money. I had to seek the kingdom of God first. And I want to challenge every man. I want to challenge every businessman. Your, 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 your main purpose is not to pursue money, but it is to pursue his purpose. And when you pursue his purpose, money will come. As a Christian businessman, you don't pursue money, you pursue his purpose. When you pray, you say, Lord, this is your assignment, therefore I need money for this assignment. So seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So money, it is not everything, but purpose, it is the thing. So I was taught at, the, at that age to say, if you want to see God favoring you, you know, and then understand that money is not everything. And this is what we need to teach people. And that was the second lesson. Is this good for you? Because these are my lessons. Is it okay? Can I continue to share these lessons with you? And then the third thing it was, when it comes to women, because my fathers taught me, when it comes to women, they say, inner beauty counts. Inner beauty counts. And the scripture says in Proverbs 30 verse 1, you know, charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. I know most of the time we, 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 we love the charm as men. But I was so blessed to have fathers who taught me to say it is not about the charm. I know those of you who used to watch television about the, the advert of Cremora. This man would say, you know, uh, it's not inside, it's on top. <laughs> Remember that advert? So I want to tell you, it is not on top this time, it's inside. <laughs> it's about what is in the inside. If you want to have a wonderful marriage, check what is in the inside. You know, don't go for what is on the outside. Especially the African girls, you know, they're they, they good. The African girls, they're good. I know there are no ladies here. I know there are no ladies. If you are here, you are a lady, you are in a wrong place. But man, it is not about that, it's about the heart. It's not about the watermelon. They might have the watermelon, they might have all this other stuff, but what is in the inside? And what is in the inside? Listen, take this statement. Take this statement. My father said, don't marry the person you think you can live with. Marry only the person you think you can't live without. Marry the person that you think you can't live without. That is how you choose a life partner. That is how you get it right. So it is always about the inner you know, beauty. And in number four, my father, lesson my father taught me is that human beings are not angels. I love this. That human beings are not angels. You know, always have a room for disappointments and betrayal. But when you are being betrayed, my father said, you know, forgive quickly and move on. Because as long as you live here on planet Earth, you're going to be betrayed. You know, you're going to be offended. As a man, understand that human beings are human beings. They are not angels. Be sober. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get disappointed. Even in a building like this, even in a building like this, in a, in a fellowship like this, we don't view things the same. We are not angels. So don't ever lose God's assignment because you've been offended by somebody. How many people leave our churches because they are offended? Because we have many expectations. People are not angels. People are human beings. And when you have that type of an attitude, you will always open your arms for people. Aren't you glad that lessons like this, they've helped me to act the way I act. You know, when the whole country was against fighting, want to persecute Uom Angus because of what he said. You know, based on this teaching, this teaching came to my mind and say, he is just a human being. 
anybody can make a mistake. You know what I did? While people were attacking him on the social media, I gave him a call. I gave him a call. I said, sir, we need to talk. We need to talk. And it was so good of him. He said, you know what? Let's talk. I'm not trying to blow my trumpet here. I'm the one who was initiating that talk, you know, to reconcile him with the church, to reconcile him with the nation. And my statement to these pastors and the nation that was angry, I was saying, look at the work of this man. This man has worked so much over the years building this nation. We're not going to bury Uom Engas just because of one mistake. He is not an angel. He is a human being. And on top of that, he has asked for forgiveness. And come on, let us forgive him. He's not an angel. We had that. And I'm so grateful that it was because of my teachings that I received. But if people have been told that people are angels, we don't have grace for them. I want to tell you, sitting here, if you want to become a good man, you want to impact the next generation. Teach them. People are not angels. They've got mistakes. They will blunder. They're not angels. And we need to give them a second chance so that they can prove themselves. And that has been a key of our ministry. The name of our church is Hope Restoration Ministries because we understand that people are not angels. They're going to make mistakes. Yeah. And even in marriage, if we can have these principles, even in our marriage, you know sometimes it is okay to be hurt by somebody that does not love you, but not somebody that, you know, is here with you. It, it's so painful. You even said, but sweetie, I was not expecting this from you. You. <laughs> we are like this. You, you. How can you say this? You. She's not an angel. Yeah. She's not an angel. And then if you can understand that, you will forgive your spouse and move on. Yeah. Why many marriages, they can't survive? It is because we love these people and then we idolize them to a level of angels, yet they are not angels. If you are planning to get married, young man, there's no angel out there. <laughs> and here is another one that I've learned. And he said, respect women. A lesson that I've learned from my father. Respect <laughs> women. Respect women. Respect and be kind to women. You know, the scripture says in Peter, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, Husbands, in the same way, treat your wives with consideration as a delicate vessel so that your prayers will not be hindered. Wow. You know, we don't read scriptures like this. You've got men who are praying, Yere, 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 Yere. Oh, God, God is looking at you. Yere, yere. There's no answer. Nothing. God says, you know what? Take care of this woman. Your prayers are hindered. You can shout. You know, it's words with the African guys. Baba, baba, ba. Nothing's going to happen. You've got the basic things that you need to do. Honor your wife so that your prayers are not hindered. You don't see a breakthrough in your life. And this man said to me, Chris, honor your wife. I know you are an African man. You always demand women, they must do things for you. Do things, bring water, bring food. On the other side, she's taking care of, let me tell you, I mean, as an African man, I'm just taught women must serve me. I'm sitting there, she's busy caring for the baby. Hey, no, bring Bring. And I thought it's a, it's a normal thing. It is everybody's doing that. And she'll say, I'm busy with that. I'm busy with that. And then Draymond told me and said, listen, Chris, I know you're an African man, but this is how you do. If you want God to favor you, honor your wife. Honor your wife. Honor your wife. You know, I, never, I saw this white man, you know, and washing the feet of his wife. I said, what? What is that? African men, we don't do that. 
He said, if you love her, you honor her. Yeah. That is grace. And for the first time, my wife, she even thought, are you dying? <laughs> What's wrong? I said, no, I'm not dying. I have been taught how to honor her. And I'm telling you, unfortunately, my class, you know, we've got small kids here. But I'm telling you, after washing the feet, brother. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. After washing the feet. Mm. Some of you, some of you, you don't get it because you don't wash their feet. They are stingy. They are stingy because you don't wash their feet. Wash their feet, you will see, man. Some of you try it tonight and say, honey, I came to this conference. They said I must wash your feet. <laughs> be honest, and you'll be amazed after washing those feet. I, I'm, I'm going to leave my phone with Paul, and then you must give me a report. Wash their feet today. I'm telling you, something's going to happen. I thank God. I thank God. So even now, when I start washing the feet, she says, I know what you are up to. <laughs> that was a lesson from my father. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> my father said to me, be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. You can't have them all. Look at that picture there. Guys, be content with what you have. Be content. You know, the devil has a tendency to say to you, there is something missing in your wife. You'll be driving around and you look around and you think, you know, there is something missing. You must learn to be content. Contentment, it is something, it is not something that will be given to you automatically. It is something that you must learn. You must develop. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, you know, I, I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. He says, I have learned the secret of being content in every and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, you must learn the secret of being content. You know why marriages are not making it? Because people, men, are not content with what they have. And the devil will keep on coming to you and say, this woman, she's not enough. She is enough for you. It is the tricks of the evil one. But you must learn, you must exercise, you must exercise the discipline. Speak to yourself and say, I am content. She is more than enough. There's no need for me to go for an extramarital affair. There's no need for me to ask for someone's telephone numbers. I am content. Things may not be enough, things may not be good in this marriage, but I strongly believe God is going to be okay. Problems does not mean she is not enough. It is just problems. Deal with the problems on the table and leave that relationship alone. Don't tamper with the relationship. Men have a tendency of not solving the problems, of not dealing with the issues. When they've got problems, they want to go somewhere. Maybe sit next to the television, entertain themselves with other crazy stuff. And then you think she is not content because they've been watching a lot of pornography. She will never be content because there's something that feeds your spirit. But learn to be content with what you have. I've been married now for 23 years, and I have learned to be content with what I have. I mean, the truth is, there are people here who have been married for over 30 years, 40 years, and we need to honor them. Is there anybody who has been married for over 30 years and above here? Can we honor them? If you don't mind, can I ask all these men? Let's honor you, sir. We just want to honor. Would you please stand on your feet? We just want to honor you. All of you have been married for over 30 years. Let's honor them. Let's honor them. There you go. We honor you. Thank you. Thank you. So it is doable. 
It is doable. So we want to honor you. Thank you for being an example. Be content with what you have. Number seven, a lesson my father taught me. Never be too busy for your family. Never be too busy for your family. Family is fragile like a glass ball, and you must always handle it with care. You know, technology has brought a lot of damage in our families. And I want to challenge you, especially you, my white brothers. We are African. I clap. <laughs> I'm not going to go for a dinner and uh, I'm sitting here, my, my boy is busy with the, with the phone on the dinner table. I don't have time. I don't even care what the government says. Ella, hey. <laughs> it's dinner time here. It's dinner time. We are on dinner here. I'm not going to sit here and then you are busy on your phone. You know, you're sitting with me and then you are communicating with somebody outside. You know, you can't talk, you, you, you switch off that thing. Switch off. We eat here. Now, I, I look at some of you on the restaurant when you go outside, your, 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 your boy is busy there with phone. Phone while you are sitting on the, let me tell you, you are raising a monster. Discipline that boy, put it down. Put, put, hey. If you don't know, tell them that's a pastor Chris said, you must put it, put it down. We're eating now. It's time for, for dinner. We're raising a generation that must lead and respect, you know, the nation and respect their wives. But all that I'm saying to you, never be too busy. Because sometimes even us, when we come, you know, here you are, you come from work, but you're still busy with your computer. You're still busy with your gadget. Guys, technology, civilization, beautiful as it might be, is damaging our families. There are many people who are busy pursuing their career, pursuing their businesses, you know, at the expense of their families. My father said to me, my father said to me, Chris, as much as God has called you, as much as God has made you to be a man of influence, always bring a balance. Do God's work and love your family. Spend time with them. You are not supposed to be a hero out there and be a zero at home. You don't want that. You know, there are men here. You know, your wife must actually make an application just to speak to you. Daddy, can we see you this evening, 7 o'clock? Because you don't have time. They must make an appointment. We have made it a principle in our church. My kids in a green room, they can come anytime. Anytime they can approach because I must always make time. So I want to ask you, man, based on the teaching that I've learned, you know, make sure that you make time for your family. Joshua says, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Don't leave them behind. Serve the family. Serve God with your family. You know what I'm praying for next year? This conference is that you're going to come here with your boys. Come with them. Don't leave them behind. Bring them along. Let them come and see what men are doing in the house of the Lord. Is this good? Yes. And number eight, the lesson that my father taught me is that he said to me, lead beyond yourself. If you want to be a leader, he said, make sure you lead beyond yourself. He said, put others first. You know, this is one of the pictures that I have in my office. If you ask me who are the most people who have ever influenced my life. Those two men on that picture, they've influenced. I'm saying two men, not one, two of them. Because you had a man who was a president then, but he saw beyond himself. This man must, the black must be honored. He must be honored. I know maybe, maybe some, they, they cannot, they don't want to honor him, but I strongly believe he is a man who saw beyond himself. Yeah. He said, you know what, I'm not going to be here forever. I'm thinking about the next generation. And my father said, if you want to become a leader, you must always see beyond yourself. It is not about your needs. It's about the needs of the next generation. About the needs of the next generation. Lead beyond yourself. I love that. And I challenge every man, always see beyond yourself. Always lead beyond yourself. Don't die with things. You know, there's the problem that we have in Africa. 
You know what's the problem of Africa? The problem of Africa is that we've got leaders who can't see beyond themselves. They can't lead beyond themselves. In Africa, people, they build things, build things. And then after building things, they take a chisel and a hammer. And then they break the very same thing that they've, they've built. Now, look at Zimbabwe. The guy, you know, who was building Zimbabwe, after that, for 37 years, even when they were saying to him, it is time now to step down. No, I'm not going anywhere. Zimbabwe is my Zimbabwe. He took a, a, a chisel and a hammer, destroying the very same thing that he has created. You look at our government people who are leading the very same government, the very same people who were leading this country, who wanted the liberation of this country. You know, after they got it, they take a chisel and a hammer themselves. You know what they do? They break the very same thing that we have built. I'm not sure if you want to listen to this one. Look at what DA they've done over the years. Now they are taking the very same hammer and the chisel. After they've built the very same great organization, now they are breaking the very same thing. What a great opposition that we had. Amen. We need to learn to lead beyond ourselves. And these are the things that I'm begging the leaders in this nation. I'm begging everybody. I say, guys, it is not about your stomach. It is about the next generation. Think beyond. Lead beyond yourself. What's wrong with us? And let me tell you, this is not an issue of a color. It's an issue of a location. When you are, you are in Africa, there is this demon in this nation, in this continent. And I pray that... God will give us a rescue and an answer. But all that I'm saying to all of us here, let us lead beyond ourselves when you are no more. And I, I find confidence, Paul, to, to preach this here at Hope. There are some other messages I can't preach anywhere. But you see, I was confident to say this point right here because I looked at your leadership. You went to Zambia, and then you've done great work there. You've done great work. And you know what? You even left there. You allowed people to lead that organization. That is what I call leadership. You live beyond yourself. Because that is how your leadership will be tested when you live or when you are no more. Whatever you have built, will it sustain itself or will it die with you? So lead beyond yourself. When you look at the scripture, it says in, in Philippians 2, it says, do not, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Scripture right there. Lessons my father taught me. And a number nine lesson my father taught me is that always honor the Lord with your wealth. Always honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. And it says, then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I'm so grateful that my father taught me to honor the Lord with my wealth. You know, the, the, the challenge of this generation is that you've got a generation that is so wise, that is so smart, they make a lot of money, but they don't have the kingdom of God in mind. Yeah. Why we struggle to, to advance the kingdom of God is that we've got a lot of people in the house of the Lord. They don't have the kingdom of God in mind compared to the old generation. You know, the generation of givers in the body of Christ has died or now they are in pension. They are no longer able to advance the kingdom of God. But the studies revealed are revealing that the, this next generation, the one that we are pastoring, they don't want to tithe. They don't want to give. They don't want to advance the kingdom of God. They are far away. Their hearts are far away from the things of God. We struggle to advance the kingdom of God because our generation today, they are not generous. But I want to challenge you as men. I want to challenge you as business people in this place that make sure that you advance the kingdom of God and you honor the Lord with your wealth. Be generous. Be generous. This is another one my father taught me. He said, be generous 
always find a way to be a blessing to someone. You know, my father taught me, he says, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. You know, the other thing that the Lord has done to my life, or should I say, I strongly believe, Paul, I'm standing here because of the heart of generosity. Generosity in the area of forgiveness. People, they look at me and say, what type of a man is this? They said, you know what? Would love to spend time with you because you are so generous with your forgiveness. You are so generous with your giving. Because if you are generous, your world will become larger and larger. My father taught me that. He says, be a generous person. People, they love to surround themselves with generous people. This is one of the lessons that I have learned from my father. I pray that as we continue with this conference, based on these lessons that I have learned, there is still more that I still continue to learn from my fathers. But I pray that this morning, with these lessons that I've learned from my father, they'll be a blessing to you as much as they've been a blessing to me. Many people, they keep on asking, what is the secret of your success, Chris? And I look back, I said, the lessons I have learned from my father. Take these lessons, and I promise you, you will be a blessing in this nation and even into the next generation. God bless you.